There we are recording now. Thank you for the reminder. Normally I try to remember that and I've been pretty good, haven't I? Um, so back to questions. Today is Monday, the 4th of May, um, a and 1. We thought we'd start off with questions on lab and um, actually you're working on exercises 30, let's see, 37 and 38, right? And you had a quiz today or you're, maybe you've already taken the quiz. Um, I will this afternoon free up 39, 40, and 41, which are the three exercises we're doing this week. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about those. Um, 39, if you have your lab book, is cardiac cycle. And like I think I mentioned last week with regard to this past week's blood cells and blood typing and heart structure, a lot of the exercises, at least two of the three th that we're doing this week, are a uh, review of things we've talked about in the uh, cardiovascular chapter, which was 15. So cardiac cycle, exercise 39, basically starts off talking about heart sounds and had we met in person, I would be distributing stethoscopes out to you guys and you'd be listening for the characteristic lub, dub, lub, dub, right? Sounds, the two heart sounds we associate with the heartbeat. And if you look on figure 39.1, if you happen to have your lab book there, there's a, a sketch of the heart relative to the ribs and um, those little circles that they have there are um, designated areas where you'd put the diaphragm part of the stethoscope near, and then you'd be listening for these different sounds. Um, and so the first heart sound, the lub of the lub-dub sequence, um, is due to closure of the AV valves. You know those are which valves, specifically? What are the AV valves? Atrioventricular valves. Anybody? Uh, tricuspid and bicuspid? Mm hmm. Because they snap shut together. And that's what you hear for that first heart sound. The second heart sound is the closure of the semilunars, the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves. So that's what you listen for with the stethoscope. That's what the physician is listening to or the nurse practitioner. You go in for a checkup. They tell you to breathe in and out, right? And they put the stethoscope on your chest and on your back sometimes. And they're listening for several things. They're listening for lung, clear lungs too, but they're listening for heart sounds. And uh, many years ago, I had uh, a little episode with pericarditis and inflammation of the pericardial sac. And I went to the cardiologist and he was listening to my heart, obviously. And he heard um, the rubbing of the heart itself against the pericardium, the sac. He could hear that. He was a, he'd been in cardiology for, gosh, probably 30 or 40 years. He was very, very well trained. And uh, he heard that rubbing and he diagnosed the, an issue with the, with the sac. So you can detect other things too, besides just heart uh, valve issues. Um, so that's really what we would have done in that procedure A. So I would just be familiar with what those two hard heart sounds are, are due to. Part B or procedure B, electrocardiogram, we've talked about that in, in chapter um, 15 as well. ECG, and there's the characteristic waveform you see there in figure 39.3 of your lab book, the P wave, the QRS complex, and then the T wave. And as I think I may have mentioned last week, um, normally, if you go to the hospital and you have an ECG done or at a doctor's office, they'll often use a 12 lead system. So there's 12 of those little sort of electrodes that they place, you see here on the hand and the foot, but there'd be 12 of these they'd place on your, your chest usually and your back. Um, if we had done this 
in lab, and we would have actually done it had we been in person, we would use um, a, what they call a three lead system. It's obviously much less than the 12. So you get um, a little more generic picture, if you will, of the ECG. It looks just like this though. I mean, we generate ECGs with our system in lab. It looks just like this. They're not you know, goofy looking or anything. Um, it's just that the 12 lead gives you much more detail and can pick up small abnormalities with regard to how those impulses are conducted, right? Starting at the SA node and then going through the atrial walls and eventually down to the AV node and then down the, the interventricular septum and then up into the myocardium. Remember we talked about that in the, in the uh, voiceovers last week. Um, so you do wanna be familiar with the ECG. You wanna know what those different waveforms represent, right? Repolarization and depolarization processes in different regions of the heart. Um, and as I think I mentioned uh, last week, I hope you're also doing these questions in the back in the lab uh, report parts of each exercise. There's some really excellent questions and the answers to those you know are, are posted in Blackboard. Um, so that was pretty much exercise uh, 39. And I will be, uh, again, posting some videos uh, in the course shell uh, by the end of today that you can you know, watch. But we've talked about a lot of that already. Um, let's look at exercise 40 then, which is the second of the three exercises scheduled for uh, this week. And this is entitled Blood Vessel Structure, Arteries, and Veins. And it starts off there in figure 40.1 with a comparison between artery and a vein. And this is the same set of diagrams that the textbook uses, so it should look familiar to you. And it's asking you to label the, the three tunics, if you will, the three layers, the tunica interna, tunica media, and tuna, tunica externa. And they review that uh, in the uh, procedure A section just below the diagrams. Um, so I would simply ask that you take a look at the anatomy of those two blood vessels and be familiar with how they might be similar or more importantly, how they may be different. Um, then uh, as we flip to the next page, figure 40.4, let's look at that next because we're not going to worry about the frog foot. Um, so figure 40.4 is showing the pulmonary and systemic circuits, which we also have talked about at the beginning of chapter 15. So you should be able to label um, those, I think there's like what, six different structures there, not too many. You should be able to do this right now without referring to the textbook. You really should be able to label that figure 40.4 with no problem right now. But that's just a really great review of both uh, blood flow to the lungs and back, we call that pulmonary circuit. And then of course, blood flow to the rest of the body and back is the systemic circuit. Great, great diagram there. Um, the next few diagrams and figures are going to introduce some of the major arteries and veins of the body. And in Blackboard, let me see if I can just share the screen with you. In Blackboard, uh, in, let's just go right to it here if we can, um, is a list of structures. So let me open up Blackboard. Are you guys seeing Blackboard popping up? File, your files. Yeah. Are we on the course shell now? Yes? No. No, okay. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to start sharing again. Let's try this. There we go, how's that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, if we scroll down to stuff to copy and bring to lab each week, there should be here toward the bottom. Blood 
vessel structure, arteries, and veins. And then selected blood vessels to know. So let's go to this one here first, exercise 40, selected blood vessels to know. That should open up a Word document. And then it's going to list by figure, okay, starting with figure 40.4 and going to 40.13. So there appears to be about 10 or so figures. Um, and I've given you the main headings here in boldface, so you can tell which is which. Of course, you're going to you know, match up the numbers. Um, but what I've done is I've given you those blood vessels that I would like you to be responsible for in terms of identification. And I know initially this looks like a lot, and it's not a small number, but like the bones and the muscles, we're trying to give you some of the major blood vessels. Understand that there are many, many more arteries and many, many more veins in the body than just those you're seeing. And I, again, I know there's a lot here, but a lot of these are repeated between figures too. Um, so I think the way to approach this would be to print off this print off. sheet and then go to each of the exercise, uh, each of the figures rather, and then I would, I would also have the textbook handy as well. And then you can literally kind of put the proper blood vessel next to the proper structure. And then it becomes much easier to, to identify. Now keep in mind that the first looks like from exercise 40.5, through 40.9, these first uh, set anyway, these are all arteries. And what do we define an artery as? An artery is defined as what? Bearing oxygen rich blood? Not always. Typically, you're right, Joe, but not always because pulmonary arteries don't carry oxygen rich blood, remember? Uh. So anything that goes from the heart? Yes, that's right. Any blood vessel that takes blood away from the heart is an artery. We don't want to specify the word oxygenated, even though 99% of arteries are carrying oxygenated blood. There is that exception to the rule, the pulmonary arteries, right? That are taking deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood from the heart to the lungs, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just, we're just going to say artery is a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart. Therefore, logic would say a vein is a what? Blood vessel that carries blood to the heart. Exactly. Blood vessel that carries blood to the heart. Typically, what kind of blood is that? Red blood. Of course it's red blood, but be more specific. What do we mean? Most of the time, veins carry what kind of blood? Deoxygenated. Yeah, you could use that word, although I, I tend to avoid that word because that gives the oh, yeah. impression that there isn't any oxygen in the blood and you know that that's not really true. But you're I right. Know, there, there is a word for it. I just forgot what it was. Yeah, no, no, I'm not saying you're wrong, but because that was the term they used to use forever ago. Yeah. But, but now, if you look carefully, books are using the, the phrase oxygen poor blood. Okay. Okay. Deoxygenated blood infers no oxygen, right? The word. Yeah. The, the fact of the matter is there is oxygen in oxygen poor blood. Okay. So it's carrying oxygen poor blood typically, except for what? The pulmonary arteries and veins. The pulmonary veins are carrying oxygen rich blood to the heart, aren't they? And where's that blood coming from? Anybody but Sarah. <laughs> the lungs. Right. Okay. And then the uh, the last four exercises, of course, are focusing on on the veins. And as you note, as you look through these figures, typically, when you look at a at a diagram of the leg, arm, face, what have you, arteries are shown in red. 99% of the time, the only exception to the rule are the pulmonary arteries. And likewise, veins are typically colored blue because they typically carry oxygen poor blood. 
So whenever you see a blue vein, a blue blood vessel, you can assume it's more than likely a vein, and red is more than likely an artery. Um, now, what I'm not asking you to do is to tell me specifically where this blood is traveling, if it's coming through the hepatic artery, although you might already know what hepatic refers to. Anybody know? Hepatic? It refers to liver. Splenic, what do you think that refers to? Spleen. Spleen, yeah. So this is taking blood to those organs. So some of these are pretty easy. If you just, if you knew the, the terminology, if you will, renal, you know what that is. Kidneys, right? Yeah. Um, but some of these other ones, like if I said common iliac, well, you, you probably, you know, don't know much about that set of pair of arteries, but it's taking blood somewhere as is any artery. And I'm not going to be asking you like what artery takes blood to the stomach or what artery takes blood to the right arm. Um, nor am I going to ask you, uh, you know, blood coming from um, or coming through the basilic vein is draining blood from what part of the body. Okay, I, I'm not going to get that specific. If you were going into medical school, you can be guaranteed you'd have to know a hell of a lot more <laughs> blood vessels and where they are taking blood to specifically and where they're taking blood from specifically. So this can get more complicated. Um, I would just really think that as you go into nursing, most of you guys, you're going to want to be familiar with the general blood vessels and their location relative to where in the body would I go to look for those. Okay. Any questions on that particular handout? Okay, the other thing that I thought I would also mention back in the um, stuff to copy and bring to lab each week, you see this other um, file. Are we, are we back to the uh, course shell, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, exercise 40, blood vessel structure, arteries, and veins. We open this up. This is going to go specifically to the models, arm, leg, and torso. Um, similar to what we did with some of the other organ systems, if you recall, right? So if you do that exercise that I described a moment ago, right, going into exercise 40, labeling the needed structures, arteries and veins, then when, then when you're kind of thinking you're comfortable with that, then you could begin to actually look on leg models, arm models, torso models, and try to identify some of these major blood vessels. Now, not all of them listed in the lab book are listed here on this sheet. As you can tell, it's a much abbreviated list. Um, but I will be looking for some videos on YouTube after our class today that I'll post that will uh, point out some of these major blood vessels. So you can watch the videos. And uh, again, I think I would do that after I've done the, the labeling in exercise 40. It's just gonna make more sense to do it that way. Um, so there's no numbers here to really fill out because we don't have the models in front of us to, to, to look at, but um, I, will, I will find some videos that can walk through some of these major blood vessels. Again, there is not a huge list. Any questions on, on that? No. Okay. Um, this exercise 39 that we already talked about, let me just pull this up real quick. Um, this is what we would have done had we met face to face. We would have used a machine, uh, a LabQuest device that, um, again, we would have hooked up. We would work in pairs. Here's that three lead system I was telling you about earlier. We can't see the. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know why it does that. Okay. 
Now you can, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. So this was this was one of those folders in the what to bring to lab each week thing. Mm -hmm. And this is what you would have brought with you uh, this week in lab. And here's that three lead system that I was trying to describe earlier, rather than the, than the 12. We would have hooked one lead up to your right uh, in, interior wrist, one there near the elbow of the right arm, and then another lead on the left uh, arm near the elbow. And we would have used a system here um, that would have basically um, gathered the electrical impus, in, uh, impulses that are being sent throughout all of your body fluids. And these are very sensitive electrodes that can pick up on those voltage changes and basically would convert them into what you and I would recognize as a couple ECGs, which of course we see here. And of course, there's the waveforms we've talked about, and they talk about those here. And they also describe specific intervals. Um, uh, let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. Do you all have the ECGs? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as we look at this first ECG, we can again see the different parts. And I want to point out these three different time intervals, which are really interesting. The PR interval would be from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. Now, why they don't call it PQ interval, I do not know. It seems like it, it's a redundant thing. It doesn't make sense to me. It, if it's going to be PR interval, why isn't, ex, ex, why isn't it extended over to the R wave where, where it comes down here, you know? Um, because we have this imaginary baseline right here. But nonetheless, they call it the PR interval. And then we have the QRS complex, which is from Q, which is right here, through to where S comes up to the baseline. So right where my, my uh, little symbol there is, that's going to be the end of the QRS complex. So it's, it's, it's the shortest of the three in terms of the duration. And then we have this QT interval, which is going to be from the, the beginning of Q all the way to the end of where the T wave comes down to a baseline right about here. So these time intervals, among others, are what cardiologists look at. So yes, they look for abnormal waveforms, like we've talked about. For example, fibrillation, the heart's in fibrillation, we got to defibrillate it, chalk it. So they're looking at waveforms and so forth, but they're also looking at times of these waveforms within the ECG, because if it's an, if it's an elongated QT interval or an abbreviated P, PR interval, could all be in indications that there's an issue with the anatomy and the physiology of the heart. Maybe there's been uh, uh, a minor heart attack, or maybe there's been an infection that's somehow impeding the pathway of the impulses, either prolonging the pathways or shortening them for whatever reason. And I can't speak to the clinical end of that, but they, they are looking at those time intervals. And they, they usually fall within specified ranges. So in this table, in the last page of the handout, you can see some time brackets, if you will, uh, where that PR interval should fall between 0.12 and 0 0.20 seconds or 120 to 200 milliseconds. A lot of times we measure these time intervals in milliseconds, one one thousandths of a second, right? That's what milli means. Um, and so had we done this, we would have looked at the waveforms. We would have also had the machine calculate our PR interval, QRS interval, QT interval, and we would have looked to see whether ours fall within the accepted ranges. And 99.99% uh, of the time they do. You send the other students to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I say, you better have your heart checked. This is really weird. I don't know what's going on. Um, once in a blue moon, you'll get a student who's had, um, say, a, an older student who's had some history of heart disease or maybe had some sort of episode at some point in their lives. And they can actually see that manifest in some of these 
uh, numbers being out of the normal ranges or even within the, the shapes of these different uh, waves, they, you can see some interesting things. Not, not very often. So, okay, so that's uh, basically exercise 39 and 40. Let's talk about our last exercise, which is 41, entitled Pulse Rate and Blood Pressure. And really, not a whole lot to talk about here other than um, had we met, we would have started off finding our, our pulse rate. And typically, what you would use is the radial artery of your uh, wrist area. You've probably all taken your pulse at, at one point or another. Maybe, maybe you're taking the pulse with the uh, carotid artery when you do aerobic exercise or what have you. But uh, when you go to the doctor's office, they're also feeling, often feeling for the radial pulse. Yeah. And uh, you might want to just try to see if you can find that right now. Because when you go to assess a pulse, what the physician or the nurse will do is they're going to, of course, hope you have one. And then they're also going to uh, characterize that pulse. Is it irregular or regular? Is it strong or weak? Is it hard or soft? These are all words that, that they use to describe pulse. Hard, soft, irregular, regular, weak, strong. Interesting, huh? Um, so we would start off with kind of establishing a, a, a base heart rate for the people in class, and we'd probably put it on the whiteboard just to see what the range is. And typically for, for you guys, we, you'd find heart rates anywhere from maybe the upper 50s up to close to over 100, I would say. There's quite a wide range, actually. And then what we would do is we would have you, uh, we'd work in partners for this. We'd have one person stand up for about three or four minutes, and then we'd have the partner take his or her pulse rate. And then we would have them lay down on the table, the bench, one of the three benches in lab. Let them lay there for three or four minutes, then take their pulse. Do you know what you'd find when you compare the standing versus the prone? Standing should be higher. Yeah. Yeah, when you stand, your heart has to work against gravity, doesn't it? When you're laying down prone, the heart's at the same level as your, your entire body practically. And so it doesn't have to pump as frequently to get the blood to and from the heart. And it's really fun because we put the data on the whiteboard. We do the, the sitting heart rate, we do the standing heart rate, and we do the prone laying down heart rate. And, um, you know, I've seen numbers where you might have, let's just pick a number, 82 standing, and, and it falls to 68 laying down. I mean, it is, it is a remarkable constant reduction when you, when you look at the data. It's really, really interesting. Um, so we would have done that um, had we met. Because it's, it's usually an eye-opening experience. Most people don't realize that there's such a significant difference. Um, if I had made you run up and down the stairs three or four times, like we would have done with the uh, breathing through the straw, which we obviously didn't do, as you all know, when you're moderately exercising or strenuously exercising, your heartbeat is going to go up, right, to get blood to and from the tissues because you're you're running a race or playing tennis or whatever. The second part of this exercise is entitled blood pressure. And this I talked about in the preceding um, chapter in one of the voiceovers, which talks about the use of the sphygmal manometer, which is shown there in your, in your book in figure 411. You probably maybe use this. Some of you are working. Um, how many people have used these sphygmal manometers, blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes to take blood pressure? Amanda's raising her hand. Juliana, you're raising your hand. Yeah, Joe, I don't know. You're not a medical guy, are you? But uh, not quite. <laughs> have you ever taken blood pressure? Um, well, not myself. I mean, it's happened at when do a doctor checkup, but yeah. Uh, Michaela, Lauren, you guys ever do it, Liz? Yeah, I have. Uh huh. A lot of the nursing students come into this 
course, well, some of them anyway, having already purchased stethoscopes, so they use their own. And, and we have, you know, reasonable ones. They're not 180, 200 bucks. Some of them get expensive, don't they? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's really fun, um, I think, to, to take blood pressure. It's a little bit of a trick to it. You got to make sure that the stethoscope is positioned, as it mentions here, on the antecubital space to get the brachial artery. That's what you're looking to determine the blood flow through the brachial artery going through the arm. And um, again, I would go back to the voiceover in chapter 15, where I go through step by step how you would take blood pressure. And I'm not saying that that the way I described it is the only way you can do it. If you guys watch that, you might say, well, I learned to do it this way. And maybe you certainly did and, and takes take really good accurate blood pressure. So you know, everybody gets taught sort of a different way. But um, in essence, that's that's kind of describing how you would go about doing that. Okay. Um, and then we also talked at that time about what a typical systolic over diastolic represented in terms of numbers. Anybody know the typical blood pressure for a healthy human resting? 120 over 80. Yeah, usually 120 over 80. And I think I mentioned the other day that the American Heart Society or Association, I think, is starting to uh, look at those numbers a little bit, and um, yeah, they're they're kind of I think what are they reducing the diastolic to seventy mm -hmm. as a recommended? Yeah. I, I could be wrong, yeah. but I thought that's what it was. I think it was seventy. It's not changing it too. Yeah. Um, but for, for many, many years, it was the old 120 over 80 was standard, wasn't it? You heard that everywhere. Yeah. Um, and again, I would just encourage you to check out those uh, questions there in the back in the lab exercise 41. At least you can do part A. The other ones involved some experimentation that, that again, would have required you to work with a partner. And we would have done that had we met. Okay, so so that's pretty much um, the lab exercises for this week. And again, look on Blackboard later today for more specifics. Any questions on that? Okay. Do we have um, any PowerPoint voiceovers we need to listen to? I was just about to talk about that. Okay. And I was thinking rather than doing voiceover PowerPoints for, ex for chapter 16 on the lymphatic system, I thought what I would do is basically use this Zoom meeting and also Wednesdays and maybe even next Mondays because that'll be our last class. And we just kind of go through this chapter as if we were in lecture. I'll pull up the PowerPoint. We'll have it recorded. You can watch it over if you want, just like you would the voiceover, only we'll be together. No, I like that idea. Okay. So that was my, my thought, Joe, as far as how, how to do that. So you're not going to see voiceovers for chapter 16. Okay. Instead, we'll use the Zoom. Sounds good. Okay. Um, as we do that, if you have questions, um, I will make every effort to monitor your screens. Um, and this might be a good time to find the raise the hand icon. Um, and since I'm the host, I don't think I have that. But can you guys find that and tell everybody where that is? So if you have a question, you can just do the virtual hand raise and I can kind of see. Click on participants. Okay. On the bottom. So right, go to so the mute me or raise hand. Okay. Melissa raised her hands. Great. Everybody find that. Liz did. Michaela. Excellent. Anybody having problems finding the raise hand icon? I don't see it. Okay. Go down okay. to participants. Okay. Oh, okay. I see it now. Raise your hand. Okay, you did it, great. All right, very good. Um, 
the problem that I'm going to have here is monitoring everybody because I can't get everybody on this on the one view here without if I want to do PowerPoint. If so, you if you go to when you open up your screen on the top, like when you share your screen, yeah, and then the top it says like options where where it says that it's shared, you can exit full screen and it'll go back. Okay, let me, um, all right, so I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share the PowerPoint screen. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. And then you're saying if I, on the top, it should say view options. And when you click down, you it should say have like an option to make it exit full screen or something along those lines. Okay, there's exit full screen. Yep. Um, but when I when I shared the PowerPoint, you guys go back to the right hand side here. Okay, hang on. I'm gonna see if I can reconfigure the window here. I'm just gonna be unable to see the all the PowerPoint and you guys at the same time, I think. Um I don't know enough about how to do this. So I guess what I'm going to ask you to do is if, is, if as we go through this, you want to ask a question, please don't think I'm ignoring you because I'm, I'm not. Um, just interrupt me. Okay. Don't be afraid to do that. No offense taken. Okay. And I apologize if I'm not able to do both. <laughs> Maybe there's a way of getting everybody. I've, we've got, uh, I don't know how many people, two, four, six, there's probably eight people or so here. And I can get about six of you here on the screen that I can monitor. I don't think I can see Liz or Kaya right now or Lauren. You guys are disappearing from my view. So Kaya, are you okay with that? Liz, Lauren? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I can see it. Okay. All right. So let's start um, our last chapter, the lymphatic system and immunity is the title. And um, basically the first few slides here are just kind of outlining some of the major uh, properties of this organ system, which if you remember the first class we met. Remember at the end or toward the end of that class, I think we listed the major organ systems as a class and we outlined kind of the major functions and we probably listed about some some organs and tissues present in those different organ systems. And this is the system that often is the last listed because it's the least thought about because it's sort of like you can't, it's hard to put your fingers literally on this system. I mean, you can do that, but you know, digestive system where you can find the stomach and the small intestine and the esophagus, lungs, you can find those in the respiratory, heart, you can, you know, it's easy to find those big organs, but the lymphatic system is much more of a diffuse system. Although you've all heard of the spleen, haven't you? That's a pretty big organ. But a lot of the, the components of the lymphatic system um, are quite small, and we'll, we'll be talking about that soon. So one of the major functions of the system is to transport fluid throughout the body. I'm not talking about blood, right? That's the cardiovascular system doing that. This is going to be carrying a fluid that's called lymph. It's like the first five letters of the lymphatic word, lymph. That's the name of the fluid. And we'll talk more about that in just a couple minutes. But in essence, it's a, it's a system that transports fluids. That's one function anyway. And these 
this fluid, this lymph that, that's being transported by the lymphatic system is, is being transported through lymphatic vessels. Now you've heard of blood vessels, right? Arteries, veins, arterioles, venules, capillaries, blah, blah, blah. You've heard of those. These are lymphatic vessels, and we'll see how they are similar yet somewhat different from blood vessels. Only these vessels are transporting lymph, not blood. When you look, however, at the lymphatic system and specifically those lymphatic vessels, anatomically, they're often really, really close to where you'd find blood vessels. It's like right next door. You can sometimes, if you know what to look for, you can see those. So let's talk about three basic functions of this system. And we're going to focus really on the last of the three, but I want to just mention them at this point. The first of which gets back to this notion of carrying fluid. The lymphatic system is picking up what is referred to as interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. So let's talk about what that word extracellular or interstitial means. If you think of any tissues, in between the cells of those tissues is fluid called interstitial or extracellular fluid. It's the fluid that kind of bathes the cells. And if we don't pick up via the lymphatic system this interstitial fluid and transport it away from the tissues, we can have edema. You've all heard of edema, haven't you? Swelling. You've seen it in patients sometimes. Yeah, that could be a result of a problem. It can be a lot of different issues, but one problem could be that the lymphatic system is unable to transport that excess fluid away from the leg or the arm or wherever the problem area is, and the leg or the arm begins to, to puff out. And sometimes it's like, wow, it really puffs out, right? There's so much edema. Um, normally in, in you and I, we don't have that issue because our lymphatic system is picking up this extra interstitial fluid and it's transporting it away from the tissues. Eventually, notice what that lymph becomes. It becomes plasma. So this fluid that we're picking up is going to be returned ultimately back into the bloodstream where we would then be unable to recognize it as lymph. It would just be part of the plasma. Now remember, what's plasma made of? Primarily 92% what? Water. Water, right. With some dissolved plasma proteins. We talked about albumin and gamma globulin and fibrinogen in the blood chapter. Um, we have minerals and gases and hormones and other dissolved solutes in the blood, right? But more than 90% is just plain old H2O. Um, and so most of the lymph also is made up of, of water as well. Um, this second function is one that we will not really spend any time on. You're going to be hearing more about it when you take ANP2, maybe in the fall or next spring if you wait a semester. When you do the digestive system and you talk about nutrition, there's a, there's a chapter devoted on, uh, to nutrition in your book. It'll talk a little bit about special structures within the small intestine. They're called lacteals. And what these lacteals do is they basically help to absorb fat from food. And like the lymph that we said is returned eventually to the blood, this fat pickup, if you will, via these lacteals within the uh, microvilli, uh, or villi actually, of the small intestine, those are gonna get transported ultimately into the venous circu circulation. So just think of this second function as, as, as it says here, lipid absorption um, via the digestive system. Most of this is taking place in the small intestine. And the last function is one that we're gonna be spending most of this chapter on, actually one and three, function one and three we'll talk about. And that gets at, how the lymphatic system helps to defend us against potential pathogens. So here we're looking, of course, at the heart and we see both the pulmonary and the systemic 
circulation. So nothing new, just ignore the green for now. I think you'd all recognize this, wouldn't you? I hope. And so this is just a, a general schematic that talks a little bit about how this extracellular fluid is picked up first by things called lymphatic capillaries. And like I said a moment ago, the lymphatic system is closely allied anatomically with the cardiovascular system. So wherever you have capillary beds, be it here in the lungs or somewhere in the systemic circulation, you're gonna have these lymphatic capillaries kind of in between the blood capillaries. They're, they're just intimately tied with one another. They don't actually touch so, so much, but they're right next to one another, kind of like my fingers are, are next to one another. So you've got blood capillaries here and you've got lymphatic capillaries here and they're like, they almost come into contact with one another. And then what you're noticing too, as we begin to pick up this extracellular fluid here in the lymphatic capillaries, then that fluid is taken into larger lymphatic vessels. And along the way, look what it passes through. You've heard of these before. Lymph nodes. Yeah. And sometimes you, when you have a sore throat, your neck kind of bulges a little bit. That's because you have cervical lymph nodes that are telling me, telling you, I have an infection. It's enlarging. There, there is a battle being waged here between white blood cells and some pathogen. Maybe it's a virus, maybe it's a bacterial infection. It depends on you know, lots of different things. But it's here that we have these special cells that we'll talk more about in a few minutes that help to protect us and maybe you know, remove, get removed from the, from the uh, lymph fluid itself. Because pathogens can be picked up here too. And then this box is simply indicating that the flow of this lymph is in one direction only, as the arrows are indicating. Eventually, again, where does it go? Into the venous circulation. Yeah. Ultimately, that lymph is going to be transported into the venous circulation, where we would now, of course, refer to it as plasma. And we'll, we'll talk about special structures here in these lymph uh, vessels that help to promote unidirectional flow. So we don't want lymph going backwards. We, we don't have that. It's only going in one direction from the lymphatic capillaries to larger and larger vessels with strategically placed lymph nodes along the way that help to filter the lymph of possible pathogens. But um, ultimately, we return that into the venous circulation. And again, I want you to be sure you don't confuse lymph from blood. Very different, two distinct flu uh, fluids. Any questions so far? Okay, here's a close up. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look right here, where as I mentioned a moment ago with my finger analogy, looking at capillary blood capillaries and lymphatic capillaries. They're closely tied anatomically, and here we can see that quite nicely. Here's the blood capillaries where that gas exchange is taking place, the nutrient waste products you know, being exchanged here via diffusion. And here we see the, the blind end of these lymphatic capillaries in green. And the black arrows are, are showing the, the intake of this extracellular interstitial fluid. This is the fluid between the, the tissue cells. And it's going into these lymphatic capillaries. And there is a force that actually helps to push that fluid into the lymphatic capillary. So here it is in green again. And what they're depicting in this diagram <clears throat> are the cells here that make up the very outer uh, edge of the lymphatic capillary. And I believe they're, yeah, they're epithelial cells. So these are probably simple squamous. And you can note that in between the cells, there's like little opening, little flaps almost here. And that's where the fluid moves. It doesn't go through the cell, it goes between the cells. So here's the intake of that extracellular interstitial fluid. There's a certain hydrostatic pressure that helps push that fluid in from the, from the regions between the tissue cells into these lymphatic capillaries. So in comes the fluid. Once it's in here, we call it, of course, now lymph.
this is showing a, uh, a larger lymph vessel. And if we look at its anatomy, we would be able to distinguish three different layers, um, an outer endothelium, a middle layer with some smooth muscle, although you don't see it here, but there is often smooth muscle that wraps around this, um, and a little bit of elastic tissue. And then finally, an outer connective tissue to help to kind of hold that lymphatic vessel kind of in place. What this does show quite nicely, if you use your imagination, is it shows the valve. This is a valve here. And remember what blood vessel we talked about last chapter had a valve? What blood vessel? Veins. Right, veins. And if these valves prolapse, what does that lead to? Instead of snapping shut like here, they, they prolapse downward and we get pooling of blood. Let's pretend this is a vein. You should know this. Unsightly bulging veins. Vein thrombosis? No. Why do women often not want to wear shorts in the summertime? <laughs> I shouldn't pick on women. But veins. Varicose veins. We talked about this in the preceding chapter or the blood chapter. You should go, uh, no, it's cardiovascular chapter. All right. So these veins are there to promote, in this case, unidirectional lymph flow from bottom to top. Just based upon the shape of the vein, I know it's moving from bottom to top. So that's one thing that helps propel it in one direction, the presence of the veins. This next diagram is showing major lymphatic trunks. Obviously, I've colored them in blue. And what these trunks do is they basically drain lymph from different parts of the body. Uh, I would um, suggest you kind of take a look at these terms and kind of have some sense of where they are relative to one another. So again, these are simply larger uh, drain, drainage areas, I guess is the way to think of them. The trunks, they're called. Now, depending upon what trunk you are in, you will deliver your lymph to one of two collecting ducts. And I've li listed those, of course, in red. The right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. You should know those. The right lymphatic duct, shown sort of here, is basically taking all the lymph and drainage areas from the entire right arm, about the right third of the head, and the upper right quadrant of the thorax. So these, this larger, uh, obviously orange shaded zone, is depicting the drainage areas that will eventually take that lymph and dump it into this right lymphatic duct. That in turn is gonna go into a vein which you'll have learned about in exercise 40, the right subclavian vein. This is up here in the neck. The other duct here, the thoracic, is going to basically drain lymph from all the other areas of the body shown here in, in, in uh, lighter flesh color. So the, the right, uh, left two thirds of the head, uh, upper thorax, uh, left arm, abdominal region, both legs. They, all this lymph coming from this region is gonna dump into the thoracic duct and go into the left subclavian vein. So all that lymph from the entire body goes into either right or left subclavian veins. And then it becomes, of course, part of lymph or part of plasma. This is the sort of a virtual flow chart that you can kind of think about as you trace lymph flow for starting from the capillary. And then we're, we'll talk about the lymph node in just a moment and what an afferent and efferent vessel is. But eventually into a trunk and then into one of the two collecting ducts and into one of the two uh, subclavian veins. So that's just a, kind of a nice flow chart. Notice again, unidirectional one-way flow of the lymph. 
Well, we talked a little bit earlier about the pressure that helped to push that, that fluid from the interstitial spaces in between the epithelial cells of the lymphatic capillary, which requires hydrostatic pressure. So there is a force that helps to push that fluid into the lymphatic capillaries from the tissues. And if for some reason that fluid cannot get in, then we are dealing with an, a, uh, an edema situation where the, where the, the, the appendage, the, the tissue, is, is it's, it's, it's just not able to, to drain the fluid. It accumulates, and uh, it's usually not too tough to uh, not see that, right? Edema is pretty obvious sometimes. Well, how is that lymph propelled through these lymph vessels? Well, I want you to think a little bit about what pushes blood through veins. Does anybody remember what the force forces were at work to help get blood from the capillaries back to the heart? Because if you can remember that, you can remember the forces behind lymph flow too. Here's one. Muscle contraction, specifically skeletal muscles. Remember that in the earlier chapter? So in the same way that when your skeletal muscles, your voluntary muscles contract, it's helping to push blood through veins, it's also helping to push lymph through lymph vessels. Breathing, we talked about that. Pressure changes between the thorax and abdominal pelvic cavities, helping push blood through veins, same idea here, helping to push lymph through lymph vessels. Just inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. The presence of smooth muscle within some of the bigger lymphatic trunks and vessels. If the smooth muscle contracts, what happens to the lumen of a vein or a lymph vessel? The lumen gets smaller. Yeah. The lumen gets smaller. What happens to the pressure of the fluid inside? Increases. Right. So that's helping to push lymph through. And our last one we just talked about, the presence of valves, helping to maintain that unidirectional flow, right? From the capillaries eventually to one of the collecting ducts. Sometimes, um, when, when women have breast cancer, they will often excise some of, the, some of the axillary lymph nodes to see if the cancer has spread or metastasized from the breast. You all know what I'm talking about? Oh, Amanda questioned? Your hand's up. Oh, no, no, I don't have a question. Okay. This is routinely done, the removal of cervical lymph nodes to assess whether the cancer has spread from the breast. Okay, if they find cancer in the nodes, that could have a role to play on the ultimate treatment. If there's no cancer in the nodes, that could also dictate perhaps a different treatment in terms of you know, what should happen next. But when they remove these, uh, serve, uh, these uh, axillary lymph nodes, they're basically reducing the pathway of the lymph, right? As it drains not only from the breast, but also even of the arm. So oftentimes, if women are, you know, if they have to have a, a modified radical mastectomy, which aren't, aren't as common as they were 30, 40 years ago, where they're removing not only the breast, but some of the uh, underlying muscle sometimes, um, and also some of these lymph uh, nodes, the woman, if it's her right breast like we're showing here, she's got to be very careful she doesn't burn her arm or her hand, her right hand, because if she has a, an injury here, that can exacerbate the edema because she's already at risk because of the removal of some of these lymphatic tissues that she could have edema in here if there's a burn or an infection. Yeah. They can't uh, ever like do blood pressure on that arm either. Right. Good point, Amanda. Yeah, they won't take blood pressure over here either. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, here's a, a photograph from a, a, probably from a cadaver or it could be from a surgery, I guess, too, of a lymph node. That's this structure here. And these are vessels that are either leading into or out of, I, I can't really tell, you can't tell by looking here, but we'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. This red material underneath, this is skeletal muscle. It's red because of, of the hemoglobin and uh, the rich blood supply that, that's present. Um, and then we have some additional blood vessels here. There's one here, and of course there's a big one right here, two in blue. So here's basically a sketch of a lymph node. It doesn't look quite the same shape as the, uh, as the actual photograph does, but we'll use our imagination here. Uh, we have what are referred to as afferent vessels that are bringing the lymph into the node. Okay, so afferent meaning coming toward the node. We would have a single efferent vessel leading away from the node typically. So we can have several afferent coming in, usually one efferent leaving, efferent meaning to leave. And what this points out are a couple interesting things, and that is if you look in the very center of the node called the medulla or medulla, you've heard of that in relation to the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. This is the, a different structure, but same word. Um, this is the, the center basically of the node where we see our first evidence of a white blood cell that we've talked about so far this chapter. This of course refers to T cells, T lymphocytes, We'll talk more about them coming up later. So lots of those here in the, in the center. Now remember the lymph is passing through here and those T cells are there to, to actually try to assist in uh, monitoring of the lymph and, and surveilling of the lymph so that if they see something that needs to be removed, they can do that. We'll talk about T cell function a little bit later. Oops, sorry. And then uh, around the cortex area, you see these kind of circular structures. These are called nodules. So you've got numerous nodules in this cutaway view where we find another type of, of lymphocyte called the B lymphocyte. We'll talk about the difference between T and B later. And macrophages, do you remember what those are? They eat, do they eat the bacteria or the? The pathogen, yeah, uh, right. Phage meaning to eat, macro means what? Large. Large, big, yeah. So these are very large phagocytic cells, as, as you guys mentioned. When they were in the bloodstream, we called them monocytes. When monocytes leave the bloodstream and go out into the tissues, like, like would have occurred here, they change their attitude a little bit and they become very, very highly phagocytic cells. We call them macrophages. Once they left the bloodstream, they're no longer monocytes, they're then macrophages. So between the T cells in the medulla and the macrophages and B cells here in the nodules, we have, in essence, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, cells at work helping to monitor the lymph, identify potential pathogens, and knock them out. Here's a stained section through a lymph node. And uh, again, you can see several of these nodules, these circular structures here along the edge. Just a histologic section. And here we see the distribution of lymph nodes in our body. And again, like the, the trunks that we described a little bit earlier that were draining lymph from different parts of the body, we have, of course, the axillary nodes that I was talking about a few moments ago that are often removed just to monitor the uh, potential metastasis of say breast cancer. But we have some up here in the neck. These are the ones that get inflamed when you get a sore throat. We've got some up here in the head. We've got some in the uh, elbow region. We have some in the, a lot of them in the, in the core trunk of the body down in the inguinal pelvic zones. Notice none in the legs. That's kind of interesting. I, you know, I don't know why that is the case, but there's no lymph nodes uh, in the legs, mostly uh, abdominal, uh, inguinal regions, also in arms, axillary, neck, head. These are all there to monitor the lymph of potential pathogens. So this basically gets at what I've been talking about. 
that here we have blood cells that are monitoring the flow of the lymph through the lymph node on its way toward the bloodstream, right, eventually. And not only are we filtering, but we're identifying and trying to remove potential disease-causing, infection-causing bad guys. They could be bacteria. They could be, um, when we say parasitic cell, uh, you've all heard of malaria, right? Or Lyme disease, right? Lyme disease is caused by a bacterium. Uh, malaria is caused by a mosquito bite. And when the mosquito bites you, uh, it draws up blood to feed its eggs. It's the female mosquito that typically bites. And in so doing, will inject you with a little protozoan. Yeah, called plasmodium. And plasmodium can go through a series of life cycles in your body, it gets into the liver, and oh, it can just be a mess. Um, but it'll also get into the lymphatic system and uh, our immune system will respond to the presence of that, that single-celled protist. So there's lots of possible bad guys out there that might try to cause us problems. Okay, well, actually it is a little after 2.30, so I think what I was gonna do is I'll stop here and then on Wednesday we'll pick up where we left off. Good spot to stop. Are there any, any questions? I heard before that lymph uh, system was major part of like moving around, I mean, white blood cells and stuff around the body. Is that still a primary kind of like thing that white blood cells do? I mean- Right, right, right. We just talked about how in the lymph nodes, for example, we had those so surveillance T cells and B cells and macrophages, sure. Yeah, but sure. does the lymphatic system move around white blood cells at all? I'm, I'm not understanding what you mean by move around. These, this is a static system. It, it, it doesn't really move. I mean, there are vessels that transport the lymph just like veins transport blood. Yeah, um, I was just wondering if white blood cells use the lymphatic system to move around the body. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. They can use it as, an, as a highway system. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got white cells moving through the bloodstream, right? You've mm -hmm. got blood cells that can undergo diapedesis, which is removal from the capillary beds going out into the tissues where there might be an infection. Or mm -hmm. they can be picked up at the lymphatic capillaries and go in between those epithelial cells and get into the lymph circulation too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Blood has the ability, white cells, to really go lots and lots of places. Now, I will say there are certain barriers that no cells can get into. For example, we talk about sterile fields. By sterile, I mean no, no living cells anywhere. I mean, infectious cells anyway. Like your, your brain um, is, is pretty much a sterile field. So there wouldn't be any reason for white blood cells to get up in there, other than if it's passing through blood vessels that are going up into the brain, I guess. Uh, I'm getting kind of off topic. So is but, like meningitis, is it like if you get meningitis, uh, then like it got into like your brain, so like it's no longer a sterile field? True, meningitis. absolutely, yeah, 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 no, yeah that, that can happen. But we're talking under normal, healthy, non-infectious situations. But yeah, bacteria, viruses can go could go anywhere in the body, theoretically. But typically, we have certain, like blood-brain barrier, it's often called. We have certain systems at work to keep these different structures or tissues devoid of, of pathogens. But yeah, things can happen. They can get in, you're right. Through a cut, um, for example, an injury. There's lots of different things that can happen. Other There's like questions? a lot of, um, there's a lot of lymph nodes in like the stomach area. Would that be because, I mean, like your immune system is primarily based off of like your, your gut? No. I don't think of it being based there any more than I think of it being based in my axillary region or my neck, okay. I, because if you look at the anatomy of the system, it's, you know, it's widespread, 
Um, are, are you saying why are there more nodes in the in that region, and that might be a reason yeah. why you would associate it with more protection there, maybe? Yeah, just like as I'm, I'm looking at it, these all these little green like lymph nodes. Yeah. Why why are they there versus more in the leg? I, I can't answer that. I mean, that's a good question. I've often thought, why aren't there any nodes in, in any parts of the legs? Um, I, I do not know. I think that the takeaway message is to simply understand that the lymphatic system itself is, is very widespread throughout the body for the most part. And there, there are cells, white cells that are strategically placed along the way that are there to monitor that lymph, monitor it for the presence of disease-causing cells, be they bacteria, cancer cells that might have metastasized and gotten into the lymphatic system, um, uh, virally infected cells, uh, things like plasmodium that cause you know different diseases like like malaria, but there's a whole slug of different tropical diseases that are due to, uh, to infectious uh, protists, they're called protozoans. Fungi, fungi can be a, a pathogen and would be identified by your immune cells. And we're gonna talk about how they, they uh, work on Wednesday, how those T cells and B cells actually identify and then try to neutralize those uh, pathogens. So I'd recommend by Wednesday, you try to get up to that section on page 625 there that, that starts talking about thymus and spleen. That's where, we'll, where, where we will pick up on Wednesday. And um, I think we're, you know, we're really good as far as our timing. We're not going too fast. We're, we're, we're just taking our time going through this. That's good. This is the harder chapter. Any other comments, questions? I have a quick question about the extra credit paper. So um, are you going to post like a Dropbox link or is there something up to put it in, to, to submit it or? Yes. Um, I uh, guess I didn't tell you about that. I did look into that. And if you go to, oh, let's see if I can show you this. Um, uh, let me, let me get out of this. Hang on a second. Let's see. I want to record this. Oh, actually I see it. I'm sorry. I didn't see it before. It's in the, the left-hand side of the underneath yeah. the zoom. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's underneath the zoom. Um, didn't I send an email out about that? Maybe I did just to the micro students. I, I will. I'll send an email out today. For what? I got the email. You got an email? Yes. Where I describe where to where to go and and and. Uh, yeah. Okay. I I thought I sent something out. But just go to the course shell under the Zoom left hand side, and it's very self explanatory. You just attach your paper and sources, and then submit. It's it's uh, it's simple. If you have any problems, let me know. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, I will see you guys Wednesday at 1.15, and I'll get something up uh, in the next hour or two uh, with regard to the lab exercises. Sounds good. Okay. See you guys then. Bye. Okay. Bye.